1788, men in uniform, in cockaded hats, in red coats that had glowed amid the battle smoke of Europe. The British Army comes to wild Australia as Governor Philip lands at Sydney Cove. A hundred years on, war drums beat in Africa. Australia, for the first time, sends men overseas, the Sudanese contingent. A new century dawns, comrades in arms. Australians go to battle over belt and coffee. 1914, the digger, from his slouch hat gleams the badge of the rising sun as he marches forward to make glorious history. Second World War, a war of machines, tanks, planes. The AIF's battle dress today is as practical as the flying kit of the airman who guards Australia's skies. There's trouble in those skies right now. Somebody's bailed out. It's only a test landing, and Eucalyptus Joe is making it. If the parachute didn't open, he wouldn't mind. Joe's a block of wood. It's an Australian-made parachute, and it's OK for the Air Force now. Machining at wartime production speed. How the stitches race through the silk. Four needles all firing in line, accurate to the fraction of an inch. By 234 yards of shroud lines, the pilot hangs from the chute. They'll never tear loose sewn like this. And behind it all, the lowly silkworm. No award hours, no overtime, but he's done his bit, tiny as it is, towards this mass production. Safety for a thousand men. And not so long ago, we weren't making parachutes. Here is pastoral peace and war seems absurdly remote. And yet wool from the backs of these very sheep might have made uniforms of the men who stormed Bardia. Here, in one of the many big mills working at top pressure, you see how that khaki cloth is made. The wool is scoured. Then the straightened fibers come from the carding machine. It is combed, and now for the fascinating processes of spinning, warping, and weaving. That multitude of strands seems as bewildering as a crossword puzzle. You try to figure it out. Get a headache and give it up. There's one popular color this season. It's khaki. Mile after mile of it, keeping pace with the Army Quartermaster's ever-increasing demand. A hundred enlisted men will be of similar build. So their uniforms are cut simultaneously. Masked to protect his lungs from fluff, the operator slices through those thicknesses of cloth with his electric cutter. Onto the assembly line and to the flying fingers of the splendid sister Susies of the Second World War. It's not a mere job to them at so much a week. Each of these girls knows that the more efficiently she does her work, the better she aids the national war effort. Just another factory workroom, but that flag typifies the spirit of those who toil in it. No soldier, she doesn't award the stripes, she only sews them on. Sort of a strip tease act. Now put your stopwatch on this. Here we go, that's a buttonhole, that was. Buttonholes with a thousand and buttons to fit them. In a cascade of brass, they pour in a constant stream from factories small and large. One process that symbolizes all the rest is the making of that rising sun badge, which glittered on the slopes of Gallipoli, which was carried through the mud of Flanders and which advanced triumphantly into Libya. Watch the power of the press, and we don't mean the newspapers. One tremendous punch, the kind of digger would try to hang on Mussolini's chin, and there's the famous badge of proud fighting men. War, modern mechanized war. 
From a sky hailing steel, the soldier shields himself with steel. The tin hat's very fashionable and the wheel of heavy industry turns it out. From electric furnaces, molten scrap steel flows into a glowing river. A steam hammer forges the white hot billets, five tons in each pump. The rolling mills seize that steel, toughen it as they squeeze it in their giant grip. A devil's symphony of clanging, clattering, pounding, the heat of an inferno. Alligator shears with a terrifying bite. The steel helmet machine smites like Thor with his hammer. And yet it's as intricate as a chronometer, runs in oil and is housed in glass. OK, soldier, here comes your hat. It may be destined for the head of a bombardier or a major general. There's only one style in tin hats. Trimmed by hand, it goes on to a revolving hat rack where it's sprayed with weatherproof protective coating. The tin hat shop. What the well-dressed man is wearing this season, every model guaranteed. As a test, one in a hundred has a bullet fired at it. And after this, if you show the maker a hat that isn't puncture-proof, he'll eat it. Industry speeds up its war output. As one whiff of gas can kill a man, there must be a gas mask for every fighter. Protection against totalitarianism's next madness. Splinterless glass discs are carefully selected. A mask must be 100% airtight. Factory tests detect leaks by air pressure underwater. Hmm, better throw that out. Now eyepieces are wired in, other components adjusted, but how does a gas mask work? By neutralizing the effect of poison which is filtered out in this container and filled with charcoal and other substances. One of Ward Industries' most unusual jobs. Girl sculptors model heads, big heads, small heads and fat heads. On them, the masks are fitted for tests by the automatic breathing apparatus. If for some reason it fails, no harm is done. You can't hurt a numbskull. Think of all the Italian generals who are still alive. No, the Mickey Mouse cartoon is not about to start. You recognize him, that smart-looking soldier of the South African War? Made your side bets? Yes, Winston Churchill, wearing the forerunner of the famous digger hat. That digger hat makes Australia's number one pest, the rabbit, earn its keep. The fur is stripped from the skins. Then a hot blast sends it in a flurry to prepare it for the felting process. Makers need five and a quarter ounces of fur to manufacture one digger hat. Believe it or not, this great spinning cone onto which the fur is drawn by vacuum is the first shape of the hat. The fur is held together by boiling water. Lots more delicate than skinning a rabbit is this removal of the shape, wafer thin, from the cone. Now they're shrinking it as fast as a bargain basement suit in a shower of rain. Automatic ironing, pressing the fur into durable felt. Blocking, watch those teeth gripping the brim as the underwater process is carried out. Buffing with sandpaper and it's all over. So on the trimmings, give that slouch hat its character, that jaunty Devil McCare character that will match the tough Australian face to go under it. And here come the Aussie hats, a legion of them. And here come the boots, Australian boots made from Australian hides. The tenderfoot breaking them in might complain, but they're stout and strong, none are tougher. They've come through the long desert marches from Egypt into Libya. They've chased after Mussolini's army. 
That was the only time the diggers wanted their boots changed. They needed running shoes. Operatives put into their jobs that extra ounce of effort because they know it's their share of winning the war. They're proud to be in the ranks of that vast industrial army which marches in step with the AIF, marches to victory. Keep the battle 